Hello and welcome back to my channel. I'm Satnam B. Today we're going to continue a trend of looking at more InDesign tips and tricks to improve your workflow. If you haven't seen any of my other videos, please check them out. I've covered a variety of topics that will help you enhance the way you use InDesign. Let's begin. We're going to start with a pretty big point, which is about color in InDesign, specifically looking into how you can actually add color to an InDesign document. There are a bunch of ways to add different colors to your InDesign file. This could be a whole video in itself, but I'm going to try and break it down into bite-sized pieces. The first and easiest way to import color into your InDesign document is to use an ASE file. This stands for an Adobe Swatch Exchange file. This is a file that contains the swatch data and can be imported straight into InDesign, Photoshop and Illustrator via the swatch panel. They are super useful as you load them straight into your file and you have the colors ready to go in any folder structure that they're already set up in. The only real problem is clients really have them on hand Ideally, brand agencies, when building a brand, will provide an ASE file to contain the entire color profile for the brand, which could then be passed on to other freelancers or agency staff to work on the brand. ASE files can contain CMYK swatches, RGB swatches, and even like lab and gradient swatches. So it's always good to request these where possible. In most cases where an ASE isn't available, you can actually import an InDesign file directly into your swatches panel and load in the colors. This can be really useful as you can copy exact color profiles directly from a source InDesign file without having to color pick or drag and drop the swatches you desire. So after seeing how you can use other files to generate swatches, we can actually export those same swatches out of InDesign into an ASE so we can have them for future use. If we select the different swatches in the swatch panel, go to the menu and then click save swatches. We can then save an ASE file to a desired location. This could then be passed on to a colleague or to even to the client as an additional deliverable which you could charge for. Some swatches are native to InDesign and you'll need to double check their usability before using them in other software. Things like gradients don't seem to migrate well due to the way InDesign processes gradients. So it could be an idea to create an ASC which contains the flat colors, almost like the Pantones, and then a version which contains the gradients. This will go down to personal preference and what the client actually requires in the end. Within InDesign, you can actually extract colors directly from an image. This would allow you to generate a color theme without actually having to manually color pick using the eyedropper tool. If you select an image, go to Object Extract Image and then Color Themes, it will bring up an Adobe CC library box which allows you to pick the colors and help you build a theme for your document. There are different moods available to choose from. Whether you want a bright palette or a moody one, you can adjust them on the side. You can also move the pins on the image to choose a more desired palette. Once you're happy, you can click OK and you can export this to your Adobe CC library or to your swatches panel. You can also achieve a similar thing by using the color themes eyedropper tool on the toolbar. The final color settings I want to go over are changing the default color swatches available in any document. When you first open InDesign, you'll be greeted with the same default color palette. These usually contain CMYK values and RGB values and black, white and registry. This is perfectly fine as a base. However, if you're working with a brand or an agency that has its own brand guidelines, it can be annoying having to re-import colors every single time you need to use them. We can adjust this so that every document created in the future will have the color palette set up. When you open InDesign, change your workspace to something other than the home page. This will allow us to actually interact with the panels on the sides. You can now adjust any setting and it will be present in any future documents being created. So for instance, if we were to adjust the typography or the colors, they will become the new default. If we import a color swatch profile, as we've done previously, the new colors will be present in any future documents. If you want to revert these changes, you can simply go back into InDesign, close all your documents, change the workspace, and just delete the colors from the swatch panel. If you have any color tips and tricks, please share in the comments below. On to the next trick, using maths and measurements. Using maths within InDesign is such an easy way to increase your efficiency when you're working. Maths is integral when building grids, moving objects, and even setting up compositions. It's a lifeline when dealing with things that are going to print or packaging, as things need to be perfect down to the millimeter. You are able to use basic mathematical functions like addition, subtraction, division, and multiplication to change a value inside InDesign. You can add some numbers to a position, or you can multiply to change a scale. Pretty much any box that has a numerical value can be adjusted using maths. Once you get familiar with using maths in your workflow, you probably won't go back. I find it super convenient. Let's just say we're working on a deck for a client 
and the client says, can we have the logo say half the size that it currently is? Instead of dragging and trying to scale it by eye, you can literally go to the scale properties and divide it by two. Using math, you can also multiply by percentages to give you an answer. So for instance, if we need to scale something by 80%, you could times it by 1.8 and it will give us the result. Similarly, we can also use the golden ratio to help us. So for instance, if we need to scale something up by the golden ratio, we could times it by 1.618 to give us the golden ratio to three decimal places. Subtraction and addition work in the same way by taking the current value in the field and applying whatever the equation is you add to it. You can also apply measurement units in the exact same way. You can use inches, millimeters, centimeters, and even points to impact the way numerical values are interpreted. InDesign handles the conversion so you don't actually need to worry. You can just add the unit after the number and it will create the correct value in the document. For instance, if you're working in a document that's set to be inches, you can actually add plus say 50 millimeters and it will convert to give you the correct answer in inches. Lastly, you can also use this to impact other properties like stroke size. So for instance, if we're working on a document and we need to make the stroke to be say an inch, we can literally type one inch and it will correlate even if we're working on a document that's set up in pixels. I'm from London and we use the metric system a lot. However, many of my clients are US based and use the imperial system. So I personally find it more convenient to work in a measurement system that I understand and I'm familiar with. On to the next tip, removing the contextual taskbar. With newer Adobe updates and upgrades, they add features that some users love and others hate. The contextual taskbar is a feature that shows commonly used tools and settings that are applicable to a selection. I personally can't stand this taskbar as I find it to be more of a hindrance than a benefit. If you are new to InDesign, I can see its value. However, for me, it just gets in the way. You can turn it off by going to Windows and clicking the contextual taskbar and it will disappear. This works in the same way for pretty much any other panel within InDesign. You can actually find its origin point and turn it off. I would highly recommend building a UI and workspace that works for yourself so you can have all your tools and panels at an arm's reach. I've met designers that have messy workspaces and others that have super clean minimal things that they have to go through menus for every single operation. So it's all down to personal preference. As for the contextual taskbar, it shows you general settings for your selection so you don't have to explore the menus. This can be quite good if you're new to InDesign and you might not know what's available. For instance, if you click on a text box, it will give you settings related to type stuff like changing the size or the weight quite easily without having to go to the control bar or the type panel. Whereas the contextual taskbar for images would showcase things like alignment or even image focused stuff like AI generation tools. If you don't mind it, keep it on. If you dislike it, turn it off. It's entirely up to you. The next tip we're looking at is the quick apply bar. This is a very simple menu system that allows us to apply things really easily. It's like a one-stop shop for searching anything in InDesign. All you have to do is press control and enter and it'll bring up the quick apply menu. This will allow you to search for a bunch of functions and you can apply anything as long as it's available. You can edit things like paragraph styles, edit preferences, and even change views. So there's so much to explore and so much to find. Next time you're using InDesign, test it out and see if there's settings that you're trying to find. One thing to be wary of is the search terms need to be pretty much correct. The way InDesign locates the operations is by using the actual menu systems and then just uses this interface as a more speedy way of achieving the same result. It can take a bit of time to get familiar with all the different names available inside InDesign, but it's something that more experienced users will become more accustomed to. One speedy hack I do recommend is using the quick apply to apply paragraph styles. This can be a really efficient way of applying a new style based on its name. The final tip for this video is looking at the history feature. Like many of Adobe software, the history feature allows us to show different steps that have been taken for a certain number of clicks. It's like a visual way of seeing your different Ctrl Z steps so you can revert back to a certain point in your file. Each step will be outlined with a basic text description like add text box, delete or draw shape. One thing I find quite handy is the create new document feature. If you select one of these history states and right click and click create new document, it will create a splinter document which will allow you to preserve the changes from that point onwards. This can be really helpful if you are testing a design direction or want to A-B test two different routes and have two different save files. This will be the same in pretty much any Adobe software. So if you do find it useful, it will carry over to the other software too. That wraps up those tips and tricks. So hopefully you found this video useful. If you learned something, please consider liking, subscribing and dropping a comment. It really helps the channel grow. If you want to learn some more tips and tricks, please take a look at the other videos in the playlist. I'm Satnam B signing out.